because it's a hymnal, it is a hymnal that, that people go to frequently. I would doubt very much if there are any believers here this morning who at some time just felt kind of down or wanted to feel closer to the Lord or, or, for lack of a better term, connect with God. And what do we usually do? We usually go to the book of Psalms. As we go to Psalms, it is just unique in the fact that it's so many different types of hymns. We have hymns of praise. Psalm 135, one tells us this, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. We have hymns of lament, of regret. Psalm 22, 1, although Jesus quotes it while he's on the cross, it was also with the words of the psalmist in Psalm 22, 1, when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? And then we have psalms that are hymns that are actually making requests of God. For example, we have a psalm in Psalm uh, 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And then we have psalms that, that instruct us. We have hymns that instruct us. Psalm 119, verse 67 tells us, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. We have psalms that encourage how can you not be encouraged when you turn to Psalm 32 and you know the context where David is confessing his sin before the Lord and he has been forgiven by God and is aware of that and he cries out these words to God in Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. And so as God's children, we go to the Psalms not only because they praise and they express lament and they request and, and, and instruct and encourage us, but also when we go to the Psalms, we're able to connect with them because they give us a sense or we feel a sense of our emotions taking place. Many of us do not approach the Psalms thinking about emotions, and yet John Piper listed 24 emotions that are found in the book of Psalms. He says, an example, there's loneliness, Psalm 25, 16, I am alone and afflicted. There is love, Psalm 18, 1, I love you, O Lord, my strength. There is sorrow, uh, Psalm 31, for my life is spent with sorrow. There is regret, Psalm 38, 18, I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin. There is shame that is expressed, and the shame has covered my face in Psalm 44, 15. There is delight in Psalm 1, 2. It says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. There is anger in Psalm 4. Be angry and sin not. And then there is grief. My eyes waste away because of grief in Psalm 6. And of all the Psalms, the big thing about Psalms, I think, that draws us to it is two things. One is, from the Psalms, we learn about God. They are always declaring God's glory. They are always talking about God and giving us insight to who He is, His character and nature. But then there is also something very unique about it because when we go to the Psalms, not only does it teach us about God, but it teaches us about our relationship with God, how we're connected to God, how we're able to express our emotions to God, how we're instructed by God. All of those things that I've just mentioned to you all pile in on us, and this is one of the things that Psalm reveals. They are, we're able to connect with them. And so he talks to us about his relationship. Uh, and he does so in a way where we see God and we see man and we're baffled because God, what we call, is transcendent. We talk about God being transcendent. It's the idea he is out there. He is beyond us. Even this morning we sang this hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. One of the things about that hymn when we talk about God's holiness is declare how separate he is, how far above he is. And that's called the transcendence of God. But then also... Also, what's unique about the Psalms, it not only talks about a God who is up there, who deserves worship and honor and glory, but that God, that one that is so far out there, connects with us. Psalm, verse, Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, listen to what it says. It expresses this truth very well. The psalmist says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have set in place... What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? He is looking at God and saying, God, why are you attentive to me? 
See, these are the kinds of things that connect us to the Psalms. These are the reasons why so often we go to the Psalms and we go there. And when we talk about this this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 139 together. And I want to share with you some of the attributes. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. But some of the attributes of God found in this Psalm and how they touch us personally. Attributes like omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. And these attributes are going to touch our lives as we look at this. And so we don't want to separate them, but rather we want to see how God's all-powerful nature and character connect to us, how God's all-knowing connects to us, how God's very presence right here with us this morning connects with us. And so we're going to do so by looking at Psalm 139 together. So if you turn your Bibles to one, Psalm 139, uh, I'm going to read it, and then we're going to go through it and talk about these things. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that are formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is some of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I lo not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them for, with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so as we begin to look at this particular psalm, what makes it memorable is that these divine attributes that he's talked about God, in the first few verses he talk, talks about God's knowledge, you know me. The next few verses he talks about God's presence, you were with me, where can I flee from your presence? In the last portion, he talks about God's power, and he does so by going to where God has created all things, and particularly him. And what I want to show you from this psalm is that you have these three great doctrines, an all-knowing God, an all-present God, an all-powerful God, and yet he is touching our very souls as we look at this. Consider, God is all-knowing in the first few verses. Do you notice what he says? You have searched me and know me. You know when I rise and I sit. You search my path, acquainted with all my ways. You know my every word before I say it. You hem me in. And then he begins to talk about God's presence. And he says, where shall I go from your presence? He is not saying God is everywhere. He's saying I can't hide from God. I am fully exposed to God all of the time. Where can I go from your presence and where can I flee from your presence? And then he says, if I go to heaven or to Sheol, you're there. If I go east or west, you are there. If you lead, but you lead me and hold on to me. And then he goes on and talks about the power of God. And he doesn't just simply say, God's all powerful. He can do anything. He says this. He says, God's power was at work in my life. Why? Because you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And so here, when we look at Psalm 139, we have applied theology. 
It is the idea that it's not that God is all-knowing. God knows me. It is not that God is everywhere, fully present all the time. He is present with me. It is not just God is all-powerful. He has created me. And so we're going to look at these three things and draw some truths from them that God may encourage our hearts. And so Psalm 136, 1 through 6, the all-knowing God, He knows me. When we talk about the omniscience of God, we talk about the fact that God knows all things, past, present, and future, and He knows them all at the same time. I don't know how He does it, but He does. And what's also true is that God knows all things perfectly. He doesn't make mistakes. He's not taken by surprise. He knows everything, everything that had happened, everything that's going to happen, everything that's happening right now in the very presence here. He knows all of these things, and he knows them perfectly. And the psalmist is aware of this fact, but he takes it one step further, and he says, God knows me. He says, you've searched me, and you know me. And God knows the very depths of our being. God knows what you think and act and say. He knows these things. These things, he, God knows those things no one else knows. God knows those things that you don't want anybody else to know about. Things that I don't even want to know about myself. And as you look at this text, you see God knows our every activity. And He does this by saying, He knows when I sit down. He knows when I rise up. He says God is aware of His every move. God is aware of every action that we take. Not only that, but God knows my every thought in verse 2 says he discerns, he understands. The idea is this, that God knows why you do the things you do. If I were to ask you this morning to be completely 100% honest, and I would say to you, why did you come to church this morning? What would you say? I want to worship. I want to hear the Word. I want to sit through a sermon. Or, I'd better go. My grandkids are going to be here today. i got to show up and set the example kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? That's not the reason they came, mind you. But you see what I'm saying here is that God understands our hearts. So we come to Him in worship, and there's a grievance between ourselves and another believer, and you're holding that little bit of bitterness. God knows. He's aware of that. He knows those things. And it can be intimidating. He knows our every word while it's still on our minds. Everything we do, we think and say, every little detail. And here's the implications. He knows our every word. He knows it before we say it. Have you ever slapped your, your thumb with a hammer? Now, when you slap your thumb with a hammer by yourself, you might shout something that might be inappropriate. I don't know. Just saying. Or if there's people around, and you, ha- you hit your hand with a hammer, and you go. You may not have said it out loud, but you know who does hear it. The Lord hears it. You see, this is the kind of thing he's talking about. He knows everything. He knows all of these things. He knows it well. He knows us that well. And if we knew everything about each other, like God knows us, it could be very awkward and very embarrassing. I mean, think about it. The teens that are here this morning, think about this. Your your parents may not know some things about you right now, and when you're 20 or 30, you might say, yeah, you remember this time? Yeah, Dad, I got away with that. God knows. You see, the idea is that God knows every action all the time. And that is true for the adults. We never do anything in secret. God is there. And it's done here in the context of a relationship. Because what's amazing about all of this is after he gets done talking about God knowing what he's like, all of his intentions, his whole personality, he knows him in his very debts, he knows his moves, he knows his words, he knows his activity, he knows all of these things. And in verse 5, he says something very curious. It almost sounds like an action. He says, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. And at first, that sounds like he's doing something active. But if you stop and you think about it for a moment, our actions are always motivated by our thoughts. He says, you hem me in. You're behind me. You're before me. You lay your hand upon me. It's like there's no escape. It's almost like a siege upon us. And God's omniscience brings us this kind of comfort. Why is it? Because he's hemming us in here. And the idea of hemming us in terms of a relationship, what does he mean by this? Well, let me give you an example. Any of, me, any of you have had children uh, know that every child's different. Every child has something different about them, some quirk, some nuance about it. And so in our household, there was a child that we could not leave the cookie jar out on the table by himself, with him being, by himself or herself being there. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to cover my bases here. You know. But so, you know, I'd say, 
leave the cookie jar on the table. I couldn't do it because I knew so-and-so was home. And when he was home, I'm sure some of those cookies would be missed, missing, and their hand would be reaching there to mix up the cookies like there's none missing. You know, you stack them up a little bit, make them look like it's just as full. You know. Now, other children, I could leave the cookie jar there and not have to worry about it. Don't eat the cookies. No problem. But what am I doing there? The one child that would not leave it there, what am I doing? I'm hemming them in, you see. I'm hemming them in. I'm protecting them from falling into the sin of disobedience, so to speak. It's just a silly illustration. But think about this for a moment. This is what God does in our life. He hems us in. We are not going to be left alone with the cookie jar. He is going to protect us from that. He's going to work at us. He's going to work all of those things for our good. We know that He knows our abilities and what we're capable of and how sin can easily set in and the things that tempt us. And God hems me in. I mean, think about this as well. When it comes to our children, just to carry this example, we know their abilities and we know what they can do. And then sometimes we also know just when they need a hug, just when they need comforting. And this is the idea. This is what the all-knowing God does. He knows me. He knows you so well. And he says, Al, I'm going to protect you from this sin. Now, I may not like it at the time. Or, Al, you need to understand what humility is, so you're going to go over here and you're going to really mess up bad. But you see, God, in all of life, as the psalmist looks to him, he's hemming us in because he knows how much we can take. He knows what we need. He knows how to bring us and conform us to the image of his son. He knows all of these things. And so he hems us in. He protects us with his hemming in. He gives us comfort with his hemming in. He gives us security with his hemming in. He gives us assurance with his hemming in. And you remember, God's knowledge is perfect, so every time he hems us in, he does not make a mistake. It is perfect, perfect. God knows us perfectly and intimately. Have you ever been misunderstood by others? You know, your intentions may have been the best in the world, and then they flip off and get angry at you or do something. God never misunderstands us. God knows our condition. I'm reminded of Psalm 103, verse 14, where it says this, for he remembers our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And so in that process, God remembers what we need in our hemming in. God knows our hearts. He knows our intentions, what, what, what we're doing. He knows our motives. He knows whether we're genuinely sincere or insincere. God knows these things. God knows our sorrow and our pain. He knows our grief like no other because according to Hebrews chapter 4, we have a great high priest who was tempted the same way we were and was yet without sin. But he understands us. He understands those things about us. He understands all of these things because his knowledge is perfect. He understands our grief like no one else does. It's amazing. It is amazing. I'm reminded of that old hymn, and you may not remember it, but nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows but Jesus. That's the idea. And that is almost an invitation to go. Jesus understands our sorrow. Do you remember in John chapter 11? Here's Jesus. Lazarus, he told you, the one whom you love, Lazarus is dead. In John chapter 11, he says, you're, Lazarus is sick. Jesus could have gotten up and gone to Lazarus right away and healed him, but he didn't. He waited two days afterwards. He gets to the funeral. Four days later, the sisters come up and say, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, he, he would have lived. Both sisters say that to him. Now, again, here's an action of God hemming them in. And so Jesus says, take me to the grave. And it says he looked around there. And then when he looked around, we find the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now, we don't know whether he wept because the people were so ignorant of who he was or whether he genuinely felt the grief. But either way, the fact that he wept indicates that he understood what they were going through. He understood their pain. He understood their grief. He understood their rebellion against God, whatever it might be. But the point is he understood and he understands us as well. God's knowledge of us leads to his provision. God knows us so well, he knows exactly what we need. Let me give you a few examples of that. His divine power uh, he gives us provision. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We're never going to have any want. 
The Lord says, we say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want in, in Psalm 23, 1. And yet you look at this verse and you see God in his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. God has given us and provided for us in the spiritual warfare. And don't make no mistake about it, we are in spiritual warfare. I mean, who was not disappointed by what went on at the Olympics and the opening ceremonies and how they disgraced the, the, the Lord's Supper? And it just was, it, it's like, what in the world is going on? But God gives us provision. He gives us Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation. Hold up the shield of faith where you're able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. Have your feet shod with the gospel. All of these things, the breastplate of righteousness. He says, I've given you these things so that you might stand strong in the faith. His provision. And why? Because he says that's exactly what you need. You need the shield of faith. You need the sword of the Spirit. You need the helmet of salvation. You need all of these things. In times of great sorrow, God makes a provision for us. In Hebrews 4.16, he says this, Let us then draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God understands our sorrow when he says, Come to me. Come and pray to me. Come to the throne of grace, and I will give you mercy and help. He understands our doubts. Do you remember John 1.5? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. God knows our doubts. He understands. You cannot hide your thoughts and your doubts from God. And so God says, ask me. Come up and talk to me. I'll answer you. I'll give you the reason. It may not be as quick, and it may not be a reason you like, but I will give it to you because he says he will. You see, this is the idea of God knowing us. Knowing us, he's not only takes care of our doubts and our sorrow and our spiritual warfare and has provided us with all things, he is also perfect in his discipline. He illustrates this in Hebrews chapter 12. God has perfect knowledge. He says this in chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. Now, all of you that say, man, my parents were terrible, don't worry, you'll have your chance. That's the idea here. Because we all make mistakes, but God doesn't make it. We do the best we can, we do to make the best decisions for our discipline, but God doesn't make those mistakes. Besides that, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best. But God, see the contrast here, but God disciplines us for, his, for our good that we may share in His holiness perfect knowledge, perfect discipline. And there are going to be times in your Christian life when you are struggling and God is disciplining you. And we're reminded at 12.6, the Lord disciplines the one He loves. You see, all of this coming from God knowing us, the all-knowing God. And so the point is, it's not that God is just all-knowing. It is that God knows me and all of the blessings that come behind it, all of those things. The second thing is found in verses 7 through 12, and the idea is that God is present with me. He begins with two rhetorical questions. He says this, where shall I go from your spirit, and where shall I flee from your presence? And we already know the answer. You can go nowhere from God. You cannot flee his presence. And the point is God is fully everywhere, always present. And so he begins to give us a list of places where someone might say, I can hide from God. He says, if I'm in heaven, God's there. If I'm in shul, God is there. It's the idea of life and death. God is there in life and death. When he talks about the wings of the morning and the sea, he's given a picture of the east and the west. It goes up and settles down. He says, God is there. There's no, no leaving his presence east or west. Even the darkness cannot hide him. And God is fully present everywhere. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture, I want you to notice when he talks about God's presence, how many times, six times, he uses the word I. It's, it's amazing. He's talking about God's omnipresence here, but he's also talking about himself. Because six times he says, I go, I flee, I ascend, I make, I take, I say. And then he says, me, he's leading me, he's holding me. 
His, he covers about me. He says all of these things here in this text, and you see how personal he's making it. It is not that God is just present. He is present with me. He is there all the time. I can't escape God. Now, at first, that might be a bit intimidating, but if you think about it, it's going to be a blessing because he is always with us. This text is a declaration of God's full presence, and yet he talks about himself. The psalmist acknowledges God's presence in leading and sustaining. He says, your hand leads me. God is not just there. He's active. When we talk about God's omnipresence, we quickly say God is there. He's everywhere. Of course he's fully everywhere. It's not like part of him here and part of him in other worships. God is fully here all the time. But when he's fully here, he is here with you. And he's always with you. His presence is always there. He sustains us. He leads us. He says, your hand leads me. Your right hand shall hold me. God is active in his very presence with us. And God is fully present everywhere, manifesting his presence in different ways at different times. You see, God is always present, and we may not always see that, but yet God in his grace manifests his presence. Think about the Old Testament the Exodus here. They come up out of Egypt, right? They're out there in the wilderness, wandering around, wandering around. They look up in the sky during the daytime. What do they see? A pillar of cloud. God's presence resting on them. At nighttime, they can't see this cloud, so God gives them a pillar of fire. And so they come out of their tents. They open the flap of their tents. They look out, and there's God. They open their tents in the morning. There's God. You see, the idea is He is always present, and He manifests, it, he manifests His presence in different ways. But perhaps the greatest manifestation of God's presence, when we talk about Him being everywhere, is the fact that His Spirit indwells us. God's presence, God's presence is within everyone who has put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. He is with us. God is uniquely present in every believer. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 9. The Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. When the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, it's not just something, well, yeah, God's with me. God's with me. No, it is to change. It is to transform the way in which we act. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now you understand they were engaging in sexual immorality here. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's the idea. God's presence isn't just the fact that He's everywhere and He's outside, but those who know Christ, He is indwelling us. He is in us. And so that takes us to another whole realm of God's presence in the way in which we live our lives and the blessings that we get from that. Let me give you a few. There are just so many. I'm just going to share a couple with you. Uh, According to Romans 8.23, it says, We ourselves have the first fruit of the Spirit. Now, what he means by that is he's taken an Old Testament example where they would offer the first fruits of the crop, the first blessings that God gave to them, and they would take it and give it to the Lord, their crops, and they would give a portion of their crops to the Lord. And when he gave that, that was an honor of the Lord, but also an expectation of more. So as believers, when it says that we experience the first fruits of the Spirit, do this. Imagine the best day of your Christian life. The best day. The best day possible day, the time when just God came upon you and spoke to you, or or when God worked in your heart in a unique way, it may be the very day that you came to know the Lord Jesus. It may be a day when a loved one, a husband, a wife, a child, a friend came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you say, like we sang today, oh, glorious day. What a glorious day He saved me. What a glorious day He saved my friend. What a glorious day God has answered my prayer in an amazing way. The very best, highest, greatest spiritual experience we have. First fruits. First fruits. Imagine taking a tomato out of a 10-acre field. And you get first fruits. And then all the others to come. That's the idea. That's the idea. Because we have the indwelling spirit, we have the first fruits of the spirit. Those wonderful spiritual works that God does in our life. But oh, the glorious day when we stand before him and we have all of it. It is a blessing. We also are instructed by the Holy Spirit. Listen to 2 Corinthians 2, 12. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. 
And so God gives us the indwelling spirit. And why does he do that? It tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.12. It says, but, we, but the spirit who is from God, and here's the reason, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And so God teaches us by his presence. You see, it's not just God present. God is present and active. And it's not just that God's present. He is God's present and active in my life as an individual. His Spirit indwells me because I know His Son. His Spirit indwells you if you know His Son. He does the leading. Listen to 8.14 of Romans. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. He helps in our prayer life. Romans 8.26, likewise, the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And then when it comes to knowing God in a personal way and to knowing His Son, the Lord Jesus, and experiencing salvation, the Holy Spirit assures us. Look what He says in Romans 8.16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. First fruits, taught by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, helped in our prayer life by the Spirit, assured by the Holy Spirit. It is all of this because God is fully present. So when the psalmist says, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from you? The answer is nowhere. And we say, hallelujah, amen, thank you God, because you are there, your Spirit is within me, and you're doing all of these great works. All of this, a transcending God who is eminent, it, He's in us. The implications of this, of his full and active presence, we are always assured by God's undivided attention. Do you ever stop and just think of what a great, wonderful blessing it is that I can just stop and call on God anytime, anywhere, any place, and he hears me? It is an amazing thing. We don't have to stand in line, we never need an appointment. Any place, anywhere, anytime we can call upon Him. And when we think about God's presence within us, it is also here in every circumstance, God is with us. Let me give you a few examples. I read uh, by a Puritan one time, he, called, he was talking about this. Uh, I think it was Stephen Charnock in his book. And he was talking about what God's presence means to us. And when he talked about it, he said, when you experience violent temptation, I thought, that's interesting. I've never heard of it expressed that way. I've heard, man, I'm really tempted this time. This has really got me. I don't know. This is a strong temptation. No, this is violent temptation. The idea that it's just tearing you apart. And what does he say? In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so God is with you in every circumstance. And when that violent temptation takes place, realize the Lord is with me. You're going to take a second look at what you're going to do or how you're going to sin because you're saying the Lord is with me. He's present and he's provided a means of escape. Um, in time of sharp affliction, I know that uh, Isaiah was writing to Israel, but it is appropriate to apply it to ourselves. But in Isaiah 43, verse 2, he says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. We can walk through life knowing about God's presence and that He's going to care for us in His way. Now, we see in this text God's full and active presence and bringing blessing and comfort and assurance and help and strength. But I know that some of you may even be thinking this because I've thought it myself at times. This is all true. But what about, I don't feel it. I don't get it. You know, when I go to the Lord in prayer, they're just hitting the ceiling. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing dynamic. There's nothing moving me. Even though I know God's Spirit is within me, even though I'm coming to God in prayer, I just don't sense it. I don't feel that way. So what do you say to that? We need to stop and to recognize that God is there to acknowledge His presence. You may not feel it, but it really doesn't matter whether you feel it because God says, I'm here, now pay attention. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Be intentional about recognizing God. If you, turn, if you look, and I'm just going to read you a couple of verses from Psalm 16. Uh, in Psalm 16, he begins by, Preserve me, O God. And then I want you to notice, For in you I take refuge. So you see the direction of his thoughts, the direction where he's going. In you I take re refuge. God, I'm coming to you. I'm not coming for escape. 
I'm not coming for anything. I'm coming to you who hem me in. I'm coming to you who know my weakness. I'm coming to you who have the power to care for me. In verse 2, he says, I say to you, Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good part from you. Immediately, he's intentionally saying, Lord, I am yours. I am going to you. You see the intention here. Go down to verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. I may not feel it, but I'm going to remain close to the Lord. There's this determination and intention taking place here. Verse 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Do you notice again? Going to the Lord. Verse 8. And this is the one that really is key. He says in verse 8 of Psalm 16, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. What is He doing there? He is stopping and saying, God is present with me regardless of my feelings, and I'm going to take refuge in Him. That's the idea, the intention of it. That's how we deal with that. It is not easy to deal with it because of our frailty and because of our sin. But you understand that God is with us at all times, and so we just have to say, Lord, I know you're here. God is fully active always in our presence. God's presence, we have His wisdom to guide us. In God's presence, we have His power to protect and sustain us. In God's presence, we have His steadfast love to continue to forgive us every time we fail. We go and confess our sins, and He is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we have His goodness to bless us. That's God's presence. So God knows all things, but He knows me. God is always there with me. And now a third in verses 13 through 17. And he's going to talk here about God's omnipotence. Now he doesn't use that word and he doesn't talk about God being all powerful, but he goes to the idea of creation. When we think about God and the act of creation in Genesis 1, Augustine puts it this way. He calls it uh, God's divine imperative. What does he mean by that? Well, Genesis 1-3, God says, let there be light. And there was light. 1 6, let there, be a, let there be an expanse, and there was an expanse. Genesis 1 9, let the waters gather. Genesis 1 11, let the earth sprout vegetation. And so we have Jersey tomatoes. These are the things. God spoke it, and it happened. It's a divine imperative. Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the earth be filled with living creatures. And then you come to 126, and what does he say? Let us make man in our own image. See, it is God's creation. It is God's work, not only in all of creation as we look at what God has given to us and the beauty, and He's revealing His power through creation. He does so in the very fact that He has created us. Romans 1.20 puts it this way when it talks about the divine imperative. It says, for the invisible attributes, namely His eternal power. God's revealing His power. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. It is God's power that brought all things into existence, including us. And so he goes there, and he begins to talk about the power of God to give us life. In our present text, he dwells in the creative power in a personal way. Do you notice what he says? You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together. I am perfectly and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. How precious are your thoughts, O Lord. It is intensely personal. And so God, in his amazing way, revealing his omnipotence, reveals him in the very fact that we are living and breathing creatures. Why is it? Why is it? That, he, that I am able to move? Why can I walk over here and then walk over there? Believe it or not, it's a demonstration of God's power because He gave me life. You think about every movement, every breath, every, every heartbeat is all a demonstration of God's power at work in our lives. Not only the fact that He has created us, but He has given us the ability to live in this earth and to move and to have our being and to do all of these things. And so when we do things and when we act, we're to bring glory to Him. Why? Because He's given us this life. That's the idea that's taking place there. A good summary of this is found in the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, and and uh, when the Old Testament talks about and uses the reference of God, the Almighty, it is talking about His omnipotence. Let me show you how this relates. Here's the question from that particular catechism. It says, what do you believe when you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? So how would you answer that question? What do you believe God's, what do you mean God's omnipotent? What do you mean God's all-powerful? Well, here's an answer. 
that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth with all that is in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, in whom I so trust as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and further, that whatever evil he sends upon me in this veil of tears, he will turn to my good, for he is able to do it, being Almighty God, and willing also being a faithful Father. That is the summary of God's omnipotence. God's power is displayed in all creation. God's power is displayed in sustaining us. God's power is portrayed in one other way that I want to mention to you that is just simply amazing. And that is God's power is displayed in saving us. Do you remember in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Roman church and he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why are you not ashamed of the gospel? The Apostle Paul, why aren't you? Do you notice what he says next? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's power is displayed in the gospel. God has created mankind, and God has made a provision for mankind. In the beginning part of the psalm, when he talks about how he's knitted together, he's talking about God giving him, giving him physical life. And so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why is that? Because the gospel reconciles us to God. The gospel makes it possible for us to have a right relationship with God. Because you know what happens. As Paul goes on through the book of Romans, he explains the gospel to them. And he says, he says men have fallen into sin. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have sinned. And he goes on to say in 628 that for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And how did God save a sinful man who completely rejected him? Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He who did not spare his own son in Romans 8, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? It is the power of God that gave you life, and it is the power of God that has made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Every day you wake up and you say, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have to worry about an eternity in hell. Thank you, Lord, because it is the power of God that he took his own son and had him crucified so that your sins might be paid for, and that when you believe on him, you too will have all of those blessings of God's presence, all of those blessings that come from God, knowing God in their relationship, and all of those blessings in the fact that he has given you new life. He says very clearly, in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, as he con con continues to share the gospel. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God has displayed his power in creating us. And God has given us this new life. And not only has he shared his power in all of creation, it says, I am God, look what I have done. He says, I am God, look what I've done in your life. You rejected me. You left me, you fall in sin, you have not known me, and then he gives us his son so we might be reunited with him. I trust that all of you have done that. I trust that you are aware of this. Because think about this for a moment. Whatever your circumstances, whatever you're going through, whether it's great joy and contentment, depression, sorrow, weakness, grief, anxiety, when you know the Lord and you're in that relationship, the all-knowing God knows exactly what you're going through. You can express your grief in millions of words to someone else, but no one's going to understand like Jesus. No one's going to understand like the Father. The all-knowing God knows what you're going through in every circumstance. The all-present God has not left you. He is with you at all times. He indwells you because you know His Son. And the all-powerful God has given us a new life where we can go through this life praising the Lord and singing praises on Sunday morning and honoring Him and sharing Christ with others and going to the book of Psalms and being blessed by God's message to us because of God's power in saving us. Oh, it's true what we sang today. Oh, glorious day. Let's pray together. Father, 
We are so thankful, Lord. Oh, Lord, we are overwhelmed <coughs> with your presence. We are overwhelmed with your knowledge. And Father, as we come here, and we're here today because of your power drawing us to yourself and saving our souls from sin so that one day we may spend eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.